60 years after Martin Luther King's famous march to Washington, the scourge of racism continues to haunt the United States. Three people were recently killed in another racially motivated mass shooting in the country. What led to this disaster? Chip billionaire Terry Gao says he'll contest Taiwan's upcoming presidential election. How do we understand this coming poll? And Haitians have explicitly rejected attempts by Kenya and other countries to send an armed force supposedly to bring about stability. Why are they opposing this strategy? This is the Daily Debrief. These are our stories for the day. And before we go any further, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Tragedy unfolded in the United States on Saturday, August 26, as another mass shooting in Jacksonville, Florida killed three people. The killer, a 21-year-old white man, went on a rampage at a retail chain store. He is reported to have acted on racially motivated hatred. The shooting coincides with nationwide commemorations of the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington. It brings back attention to widespread hate crimes and anti-black violence in the U.S. We'll talk to Anish about what happened and the implications. Anish, thanks for joining us. Uh, now, Anish, the Jacksonville killings, another racially motivated crime. It's very obvious from the news reports and even some people in government in the United States have referred to the racial motivation behind the crime. Uh, can you walk us through exactly what we know so far about this crime? Well, what we know uh, right now is about the fact that there, like, there is no doubt about the fact that uh, this was a racially motivated crime, not just because of the fact that the three victims were uh, that were killed were uh, African-Americans or Black, uh, but also the, uh, the prior history of this uh, young man who actually did post a lot of anti-black uh, hate, uh, hate, hateful comments uh, and posts in his social media accounts in the past. And there's also now uh, some uh, you know, reports talking about how he was also previously institutionalized uh, for uh, being mentally unstable. But that aside, the fact that there is very clear motivation because if you look at some of the gruesome details of the uh, incident itself, the fact that uh, he let uh, non-blacks leave the, the Dollar General store that he attacked in Jacksonville, and that he attacked uh, in a you know dominantly African American neighborhood and uh, very close to a historically black uh, university, uh, clearly shows that the motivation was. And he also even said like there were there are accounts saying that he actually said that he wanted to kill. Black people. So these are like as triggering the details are, it's very clear. And that is the reason why at this point we do not have anybody disputing, no matter who they are at, across the political lines. You actually have people having to admit the fact that this was a racially motivated crime. Unlike in previous incidents where you have had, uh, you know, mass killings, uh, mass shootings happening uh, against certain. Uh, minority and uh, very often the police keeping details vague because they do not have a very clear cut reason being given by the perpetrator himself. So that is uh, not being seen right now, but nevertheless, um, as much as debates will continue on, uh, you know, uh, creating restrictions on gun ownership, uh, because the fact that he actually bought the uh, weapon legally is something that has been highlighted as well. Uh, uh, will be uh, there will be a national debate about you know the state of uh, how race relations are functioning in the United States right now, considering uh, at a time when you are going to face a very polarized uh, election season in the next few months. So this is definitely going to concern everybody, and also like we also need to remember this is a time of like great importance for Black history. Uh, we're talking about the 60th. Uh, anniversary of the March on Washington, a major uh, milestone in civil rights movement. And uh, he, uh, him actually taking that day uh, on Saturday, which when the commemorations began for the 16th anniversary, uh, clearly shows there is a very, you know, pointed intent from this young man. And that is 
just a symptom symptomatic of uh, a larger racism problem and institutional violence that we see in the US that does not get as often uh, reported uh, as it should be at the moment. Yes, Anish, and, and you know, obviously there's not going to be a trial in this case because the shooter has shot himself after he killed those three people in Jacksonville, right? Yes, there would be a trial at the moment, obviously, but there will right. be a, a proper investigation on that. Yeah. And that's interesting because there are conf sort of conflicting reports coming out, you know, that you know, about his priors. There's no criminal record, but there's some sort of a detention he underwent, perhaps to check for his uh, state of his mental health, etc. Now, isn't this uh, actually what happens whenever there is a racially oriented crime or whenever there's a mass shooting? Uh, you know, there are attempts to sort of show that this is an isolated incident, one person did it, uh, maybe a troubled individual. Um, you know, is, does this say something about the pattern we've seen of racial crimes in the United States? Uh, like, one of the things that we need to point out, like, obvious patterns are uh, being sidelined, even right now when the sheriff made, uh, you know, gave a detailed account of the incident of Sheriff in Jacksonville. Uh, he actually tried to say that it was an abnormal activity. It was not something normal uh, and that it was not something common. It shouldn't be, it's, it was a senseless act of violence, but it was not really senseless in that sense. It was uh, It was some uh, something of a very target, like targeted violence of this kind is not really senseless. It's a very clear, uh, you know, it came with a very clear intent and that cannot be just brushed aside with, you know, prior history of, uh, of uh, you know, mental health. Uh, and that is something that should be uh, taken into consideration. But on top of that, we also need to talk about, you know, the larger pattern of racial violence in the United States, because mass shootings are one of the things and not just racial violence, we're talking about hate crimes in general. And mass shootings are just one of them. It is, we, are, we also need to look at attacks on individuals, uh, physical violence, many of which do not actually lead to death, but obviously uh, leads to, you know, injury. Uh, many of the times properties are attacked, churches are attacked, burnt down. Uh, and we're talking about Florida, which is, and Jacksonville especially, which has recently seen very uh, heated debate on the Confederate legacy of the state. The Confederates being, you know, the pro-slavery, uh, uh, you know, partisans in the, during the U.S. Civil War. And so a lot of uh, the monuments, statues, uh, memorials uh, named after Confederate generals and leaders uh, are being questioned by, uh, you know, uh, anti-racist movements and also the black uh, residents of the region who want that history to be taken down and to be put into the, you know, the dustbins of history where it actually be uh, belongs. And this has also led to, a, you know, a range of very uh, very problematic uh, uh, rhetoric from the mainstream media, obviously, but also from the political leaders in the region and complete silence from some of the, uh, you know, non-Republican, non-right-wing uh, leaders and politicians, especially from the Democratic Party, who have not made much of it. And there is obviously, we need to talk about the fact that, like, this is something that should be added, that hate crimes, uh, the, we do not have a comprehensive report, a current comprehensive report of the, uh, the uh, of hate crimes in the U.S. because the U.S. government is kind of slow. We, the latest that we have is of 2021, where already the uh, U.S. State Department actually talked about, uh, sorry, the U.S. Justice Department uh, talked about how uh, there was a massive increase of about 11% in the uh, in the number of hate crimes. Most of the hate crimes being, uh, nearly two thirds of them being racially motivated, a large number of them targeted at black people. And so this is a general tendency and all of these people, the perpetrators are not really mentally unstable. They are not lone wolves. They are not, you know, these are not isolated incidents. There are thousands of cases in a year which are not taken into account. And this is on top of institutional violence, police violence, police killings that run up to like nearly a thousand every year. Thousands of, uh, more than a thousand people are killed every year by police violence. And that is also uh, some, and much of that is obviously also racially motivated in some way or the other. So these are factors that are not really taken into account. And this actually fits the pattern and create 
and gives you a proper picture of what uh, the situation is right now. And this violence obviously also extends to what we have seen recently on uh, queer people, especially trans people and the anti-trans hate very recently. And obviously legislation, set of legislations that come where voting rights are restricted for black people on under various pretenses and uh, also for uh, sort of queer people. And this creates a situation where such hate will create such symptoms of, you know, in terms of like a certain lone wolf creating. So this is, uh, you know, part of the problem that needs to be seen as a part of the problem. Overlooking that is obviously going to just create new such incidences in the next uh, several years. Right, Anish, thanks a lot for joining us with that. And I think we'll be back with you in just a short while. In Taiwan, Foxconn founder and billionaire Terry Gao has declared his intent to stand for the upcoming presidential election. With general elections less than six months away, Gao's candidacy could complicate the race to the presidency on the disputed island territory. Relations between China and the self-governing island have been tense over the openly anti-China policies and encouraged strong military ties with the United States under the current administration. Let's return to Anish about the domestic and geopolitical implications of Gao's candidacy. Anish, welcome back. Now, Anish, the Taiwanese candidate for president, a billionaire, a chip maker, can you walk us through what else we can expect during this election when it comes up in a few months? Well, the election season has pretty much started. It, like This is uh, pretty much like starting the situation. We already have nominations. Uh, from the three major parties. And uh, right now, uh, Terry Gu uh, putting himself in the race actually just complicates the matter a lot. So some of the key issues, like if you're looking at, like, and if you look at uh, Terry Gu's uh, campaign platform, it also kind of highlights some of the key issues that other candidates are also highlighting at the moment. Uh, one, obviously, being uh, the ongoing uh, chip war, uh, the tech war uh, between the US and China. And obviously, Taiwan be a casualty at this point, because if you look at the fact that there is a kind of a virtual hegemony, a global uh, dominance that uh, Taiwan holds when it comes to chip production, near more than half of the chips uh, are produced in Taiwan alone. And that definitely is going to change uh, in the ongoing chip war because the U.S. wants to, so, uh, you know, quote unquote, diversify the production uh, and supply chains. And that includes taking away a lot of uh, chip making capabilities and production out of Taiwan to, you know, places that are also close to the United States. And that includes, say, uh, South Korea, uh, Japan, India, perhaps, or Indonesia and Thailand. And so a, a whole lot of other places. So these are uh, some of the, this is like one of the major issues because it's a major, uh, uh, you know, a major part of the economy as a sector that cannot be un, uh, you know overlooked and obviously it is also uh, you know a big one of the biggest employers as I, if you look at different sectors and compare them chip making is one of the biggest employers in the country so taking that away undermining that is has always been a contentious issue among the among the Taiwanese uh, bourgeois if you're looking at that uh, and then there is obviously the question of uh, the cross trades relations, the, the relations with People's Republic of China, which has been, uh, well, calling it tense is kind of a mild thing because we are already looking at, uh, you know, military drills, war drills being done uh, across the straits by both, uh, both the sides, Taiwan actually involving a whole multitude of other countries, especially the US, but also uh, countries like Japan into the mix and making it far more complicated. Tense relations have already seen, uh, you know, a lot of confrontations uh, in the region that, that could have been avoided, that was not necessary, but it creates provocations. And that has also been very widely criticized by a large section of Taiwanese people. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is something that, is, uh, uh, that has always been at the forefront of the current uh, campaign. Like the campaign season has, you know, technically begun, uh, hasn't technically begun, but uh, it is there. It's already there. We are already seeing uh, sort of campaign debates, uh, you know, uh, discourses happening all over the place. So this is something that is going to happen for the next six months and the tempo will only keep rising at the moment. So 
Anish, also is China going to be sort of a factor in this election in Taiwan? Is that what this is all about? I mean, definitely, because uh, even in the last uh, general election, China was at the center of tension, and we can expect no less in the current election as well. Uh, we have, obviously, the DPP, the Democratic People's Party of the current administration that leads the so-called Pan-Green Alliance, uh, is, uh, you know, has been uh, you know, encouraging pro-secessionists, like they want a separate Taiwanese identity. People often forget that Taiwan, uh, as it runs right now, pretty much runs under the name of Republic of China, a rump state from the Civil War era. And uh, it also claims the entirety of China as itself. So the sovereignty to dispute goes both ways. But uh, this is something uh, like actually looking for an independent identity as Taiwan is going to mean that it wants to secede from the an entire Chinese uh, mainland and also Chinese uh, identity itself. And that is something that is going to be you know, a problem in the future, uh, especially with China. Uh, on the other hand, that is something that is clearly opposed by the rest of the three candidates, uh, not just the Kuomintang candidate, but also the People's Party and uh, obviously Terry Gu, because they feel that this will actually be, uh, means war, and that can be a bigger problem for Taiwanese people than, uh, you know, any uh, call, call for purification or reunification of the two countries. So this is something that uh, they want status quo to maintain, to be maintained. They do not want more provocations. They want peace because it has affected business. It has affected livelihoods and it has obviously affected stability in the region. And that is pretty much, at the, that is the reason why the China becomes the center of attention here rather than just what, whether or not how to deal with China. Especially. Right, Anish, thanks a lot for joining us with that. Recently, a Kenyan mission visited Haiti to examine the possibility of a multinational police force in the country. The mission was condemned by Haitians, but Kenya's announcement that it is ready to actually send 1,000 police officers to, as it says, train and assist Haiti police has drawn anger from people's movements and locals alike. Why do Haitians not want any such force in their country where criminal gangs have wreaked havoc in many parts? Prashant joins us with the all-important context. Prashant, thanks for joining us. Now, Prashant, can you begin by telling us why is it that Kenya is insisting on sending its police force to Haiti? What is the reason? Right, so Pragya, I think we need to understand this in the context of what has been a months-long process. Uh, involving many countries led by the United States, led by some of its allies, including Canada, to somehow pose a military or armed solution to the crisis in Haiti. Now, we know that Haiti has been undergoing a particular crisis. Uh, there's been a massive spike in gang violence over the past many months. Uh, gangs, in fact, taking over many parts of the capital, Port-au-Prince, as well as other parts of the territory. Number of deaths taking place, all kinds of violence, uh, rampant insecurity across the island. And in the uh, face of these issues, what the international community, what is called the core group, the international community has suggested is that there should be some kind of a military, a global military intervention to bring about security to the country. Now, the people of Haiti are quite unhappy with this. We'll come to that why. But this solution basically involves somebody taking a lead, sending soldiers. And now for the longest time, there was no country which was actually willing to take uh, this lead. And finally, so uh, Kenya has now volunteered to kind of lead this force it has said that it will be a thousand, a thousand strong police force. Now, Kenya says that this is not, this is meant to just, you know, provide security. We are not here to place anybody, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there's a lot of skepticism about the effectiveness of this uh, Kenyan police strategy. So, it was this mission that uh, came to visit Haiti uh, in the, so I, I believe, about last week. They were here for, they were in Haiti for about three days or so. And there was, you know, there was a lot of discussion with uh, diplomats, with the government, the de facto government of Ariel Henry. Uh, police force of Haiti, etc. So uh, that's really what's basically uh, being discussed right now. But like I said, a very extremely unpopular move among uh, uh, the people in Haiti. Right, Prashanta. Arindri seems okay with the plan, it seems, but people are not happy. Can you explain what's happening here? Right. I think, uh, see, we need to also have an analysis of what the reason for the problem in Haiti is. And Haitian people's movements have been pointing out that it is the de facto government of Oriol Henry itself, which is at the root of a lot of the problems that are, are taking place. It is the decades of foreign intervention, including the UN-led intervention, which is there for 
over a decade in the early 2000s, which is responsible uh, for a lot of uh, the issues faced by the people of Haiti today. It is decades of imperialist intervention where people's governments were overthrown continuously and dictatorial regimes or client regimes imposed, which is the reason for the crisis Haiti faces today. And which is why the people of Haiti are saying that, uh, you know, they're asking the international community, you have explicitly caused this crisis for decades and now you are suggesting exactly the same solutions as a response to this crisis, which is why the people are so furious. So uh, the people's movement's uh, approach you know, to this issue is that, you know, offer a solidarity in a particular kind of way. People's movements across Latin America, for instance, have offered solidarity to Haiti in various ways in terms of uh, capacity building, for instance. But let us solve the problems that we face on our own. We do not need uh, uh, outside external armed help or external military help. We do not need that kind of help. Let us face the problems. Let us solve the problems we, uh, we face on our own. And we are already doing that right now. They're talking about various movements that are kind of emerging as well. So that is the solution that the people of Haiti are offering to this crisis. But clearly that is not the solution that the international community wants to listen to or the international community is interested in uh, dealing with because they have a very narrow approach where they think that they will send in their soldiers again in a repeat of what was done before and try to secure it. And I think one of the Haitian people's movement's leaders in an interview pointed it out very well. He said that basically the aim of this entire exercise is to create a false sense of security and conduct a so-called election so that uh, the de facto government, uh, which is uh, of Oriol Henry or its associates or whoever the West or the Northern and the uh, richer countries choose, is basically granted legitimacy to control ruling Haiti. That really is the strategy, is what uh, the people's movements are saying. That the point of this entire exercise is just to create a, another client government which will continue exactly these same problems. So that is why the people of Haiti are very strongly opposing this move. Very important to note Haiti's history, of course, of, color, of both fighting back against colonialism of suffering for fighting back against colonialism, both very important. So I think very important country to watch out for. All right, Prashant, thanks very much for joining us. And that's all on Daily Debrief. Today, we'll see you again tomorrow. We have more detailed stories and updates on peoplesdispatcher.org. Remember to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe before you leave. And thanks again for watching.